Good morning, everyone. Glad you're here. If you would please stand and join us. We'll kick this morning off the right way. The glory land. Wait. I'm in the way, the right side of the way. I'm in the glory land. Nothing better than a great song to get us started, amen? amen. I'm sorry, amen? amen? Thank you. So, I just would like to say welcome. Thank you all for being here at Broadway. Uh, guests, we're very happy to have you here. This is a wonderful church to be a part of. One of the things that uh, we'd like to make mention is that we serve coffee every morning. So, if you don't know, I am the coffee guy. I will be more than happy to serve coffee. Thank you, thank you all. There is never any unleaded coffee at the coffee shop. My apologies if you have to have decaf. Um, I'll just pour you half a cup. Does that work? All right. If not, just make sure you come and see me. One of the nice things we do like to do is make mention of people that actually become members of Broadway after they have been here and been visitors for a while. And I would just like to welcome Shannon Keith. Um, she's a tech student. Shannon, are you here today? I didn't, I didn't see Okay, anyway, Shannon Keith is, is new to our family, so when you see her, tell her welcome aboard. Um, also, don't do it now, I don't want whiplash, but when you get a chance, there are some posters on the back, but we're having a small group fair coming up next Sunday. So if you'd like to get involved with a small group and kind of have a little more intimate relationships and chance to dig deeper into the Bible and just um, visit with some core families, um, we're having that next week. And then um, also, if you look here, this is my favorite part because I get to tear something and not get in trouble for it. That right there is we would love for all members and guests to fill this out. Um, write legibly and write slowly so I'll know what you said. And then when you're done, put it into the collection place that comes by. Not the one with the drinks, mind you, um, or the bread, but in the actual collection plate. And, and we'll do that during the offering. And then one last thing and then we'll actually get onto the good stuff. Here at Broadway, I've been approved to start a sports ministry. So if you're looking to find a way to play volleyball, softball, kickball, whatever you'd like to play, I'll put it together. I'm also planning on a couple of golf tournaments. So if you'd like to help out and start planning some golf tournaments, I've already had some interest with uh, helping me out. I am not a golfer, but I'll be more than happy to drive a cart around and give you Cokes and Sprites or donuts or whatever you need. Um, but I am very good with my hand wedge, so that is a good thing. Um, if you would like to, the current sport that we are signing up for right now is Co-Rec Volleyball. Um, and I'm picking up sign-up sheets today, but if you didn't get a chance to sign up, see me right after church real quick, 
and I will help you with that. So that is it. Everybody, welcome. We are very glad you're here today. Good morning and welcome to Broadway Church of Christ. Thanks for joining us today. I'd like to take just a moment to tell you about a few things that are coming up soon as we seek to pursue God, build community, and unleash compassion. This is Broadway Today. The Heart to Home Women's Ministry kickoff event will be this Tuesday, September 12th at 6.30 p.m. on the lower level. This will be an exciting event of dessert and fellowship. Come meet your home hostesses and your heart sisters for the coming year. We are excited to let you know that we'll be hosting our second Broadway small group fair next Sunday the 17th. After worship that morning, everyone is invited to walk through and check out the different groups represented at the fair. It will be set up in the main foyer behind you. If you're not in a small group, this is a wonderful opportunity to learn more. You may have noticed the silhouettes of children's hands on the wall outside the chapel. These represent all of the children in our Kingdom Builders ministry. We are looking for people to commit to pray for these children throughout the school year. If you're willing, please go by and grab a hand or two. Stick it in your refrigerator, in your Bible, or somewhere that will remind you to lift up these young people in prayer. Thank you for your support of our children. Guys, listen up. It's time to kick off the second Monday Men's Breakfast. Come to the lower level tomorrow morning at 6.30 a.m. for a good meal and a great lesson. Tim Talley will be speaking and the price for the meal is $6. You'll be filled and finished by 7.30. Set your alarm and come on out. Our midweek evening meals are starting up for the new season. This coming Wednesday, we will be serving dinner beginning at 5.30. The price for the meal is only $4 per person or $3 for children under six years of age. If you've got a larger crew, it's only $15 per family. This year, we are moving the meal to the fellowship hall rather than the lower level, and we're starting off with brisket. See you there. That's all for now. We hope you have a blessed morning, and we'll see you next time on Broadway Today. This first song, you know, we're... T uh Carl's message, uh, the series that we're in now, uh, this song fits so well. And I, I definitely wanted to have us sing this song together. Some of you may know it, some of you may not. We've sung it a few times here already. The thing about it is, it's got a lot of words. And I told the team, you're not allowed to breathe during most of the song. So get a good breath before you start. And let's go ahead and sing this song together. <laughs> the God of heaven. God.
my soul magnifies the thinking about doing the Lord's Supper today. Um, so many, there's so many things to think about when it comes time to commune with God. Um, but I had a, have a young lady that uh, we've been spending some time with this week who's been through a lot in her life. Um, she's had a lot of bad things done to her. Uh, and she's done a lot of things that are that are considered bad. And um, I was talking to her, trying to get her to talk to me about it. And um, she didn't want to. She didn't want to talk about a lot of that stuff. Um, and and she would say other things like, "I don't want people to think this about me," or "I don't want people to think that." And I was thinking, you know. We love you not in spite of what you've been through or what you've done, but we love you partly because of it. Because she needs our love and she needs God's love. And I know what it is to sin and I know what it is to struggle. We read this verse in class this morning and I'll read it to you. It says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one, but was in all points tempted as we are and yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I don't think that Jesus loves us in spite of the things that we struggle with. I think he loves us because he knows the things that we struggle with. So as we come to the table to commune with him and with each other, be unashamed. Uh, we have a Lord and a Savior that, that loves us in our weakness 
in our sin, in our difficulties that, that we all struggle with every day. So let's pray. Lord, we, we thank you for your sacrifice. Uh, we thank you for your life, your blood, your body. We, we thank you for being a Savior that we know uh, understands what we, what we go through. And Lord, we pray that you'll bless this bread as we uh, take it this morning uh, in remembrance of your body that you sacrificed for us. Amen. So the blood given to wash our sins clean that's represented by the cup that we're about to take, it's not given by a God that doesn't know everything about us, everything about our struggle, everything about our imperfections, our hurts, our pains, our mistakes. It's given by a God that loves us through those things. And certainly it allows us to stand faultless before the throne of God uh, in communion with our brother, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your blood. Thank you for this cup. Lord, we long and pray for a deeper communion with you through your spirit. Uh, we just pray that uh, as we take this cup, we don't we're not ashamed. Uh, we are lifted up by you before the Lord. And Lord, we, we thank you. We thank you for your sacrifice. And we thank you for all of these brothers and sisters in this room that uh, walk through this world with us. Pray these things in Jesus' name.
Now's the time when we're going we're gonna to ask you to give a little bit back as an offering to God. And I, here's what I'll say. God doesn't need sheep. He doesn't need the things that in times of old that were sacrificed on altars to him. He doesn't need grain offerings or any kind of burnt offering. And he doesn't, he doesn't need your money. God will accomplish his will without it. And if you don't want to give it, then don't. But the sacrifice isn't for God, the sacrifice is for us. And I would highly encourage you to join in to the blessing of sacrificing to God this morning as we pass our collection plate. Lord, thank you once again for all that you've blessed us with. And we pray that hearts and minds and all of us will be open to you. Things that we hold dear, things that we look to security for, like money and possessions, are not security. And Lord, we pray that we will offer these things up to you generously this morning and with a cheerful heart. We pray all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Good morning, Broadway family. In having a compassionate for the loss, therefore, go and make disciples to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, according to Matthew 28 and 19. Ministry is defined as the act of serving or one that serves as a mean. As Christians, we all perform ministry, whether it's children, food, carts, clothing, or any other service is considered ministry. I'm speaking today on behalf of the Broadway Outreach Prison Ministry. Now this ministry is not for everyone. However, we need volunteers to be the hands and feet of Christ and to go into the county jails or the Montford prison to disciple the men in white. As a volunteer, your ministry would be to teach the New Life Behavior Curriculum a biblical-based study in behavior modification. Some examples of the subjects being taught are seeking God, Christian marriage, sense of self, and other lessons with similar topics. Two hours, one day a week, is the time required, and all lessons are prepared and provided to you in advance. We especially need men to be a part of this ministry and go inside. There is always a need for graders, those who grade tests taken through corresponding ministry. In closing, I would like to make an appeal to everyone who is willing to serve as a volunteer by placing this scripture on their heart. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me, according to Matthew 25, 36. Please contact me or the church office if you're interested in becoming part of this vital ministry. Uh, if you're visiting with us today, again, another welcome, but let me just tell you we have a, 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 a worship service for our kids ages three through kindergarten. We call it the Kid Connection. Uh, they took last month off, but we're rolling again and, and uh, excited about it. So we're going to stand and sing Jesus Loves Me while these kids uh, can head that way, and uh, then I'm have a chance to get there. They're already starting, so let's sing. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. As he loved so long ago, take me to 
Good morning, church. Howdy. It's good to be with you this morning. Uh, If you are visiting with us, we especially want you to know you are a welcomed guest. We're so glad that you've chosen to be here. Uh, I know you could have been a lot of other places, and we're thankful that you chose to be with us. Hope that you've gotten a sense, a little sense of who we are as family, and hope that you will stick around for a few minutes afterwards, give us a chance to get to know you a little better. I know a number of our college students are with us this morning. We had a number that are on retreat as well, so please be praying for them and their return back uh, later today. Let me invite us to begin with a word of prayer. Father, those words we just sung are so profound, so true. And yet, Lord, I'm not sure that we, that I, even fully understand them. What it means to be loved by you. The power that's contained in that. Well, I pray that in, in some way, through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would let each and every person here today know that you love them. That those aren't just words that we sing because it's something we were taught a long time ago. It's because it's true. And we want our kids to know it. We want our older people to know it. We want our parents to know it. We want our grandparents to know it. We want our students, our college students. We want everyone to know it. Father, we live in a world that competes for our affection and for our hearts. Father, we've been on this journey trying to understand what it means to have a soul and to care for our souls. And in doing so, we recognize we're going to have to to dethrone some, some idols in our lives. And so, Father, we are taking a, a difficult journey this fall together as we try to understand the times and the ways that we put things ahead of you. And this morning, we're going to take a hard look at our families and what it means Father, I also know that we live in a world that's filled with hurt and brokenness. Lord, as we're hearing stories coming in from the devastation that Irma has brought in so many places in the Caribbean and into Florida. Father, we just offer your prayer, a prayer to you, a blessing over all those who've been affected by it. Lord, we hear about our friends in Mexico who've been devastated by an earthquake and a hurricane. Father, in the midst of all the chaos and the loss and the hurt, I pray that your presence would be strong. You would inspire your people to really be the church in those places, in those communities that need to know you love them. Father, may we do our part from here. Whether that's sending resources or time or energy or people or money or whatever it may be, not only to those places that are affected, but God, would you help us to be your people here, right here in Lubbock, Texas, to communicate your love to this city. Father, we pause now for just a moment to offer you our hearts and our minds as best we can as we want to give our full attention to your spirit and to your word. Father, many of us are carrying heavy loads. So, Father, we want to pause for a moment and just invite your spirit into us personally. Would you hear our hearts as we offer them to you now?
thank you, Lord, for hearing us, for knowing our hearts, for knowing what weighs us down even before a word comes to our tongue. And Lord, would you do what only you can do now? And would you speak powerfully through your word and through me? And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of every heart be acceptable and pleasing unto you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible with you, let me invite you to turn over to Genesis 22. We're going to be there today. If you don't have it, you can follow along. We'll have a few slides up. We've been talking about uh, American idols. What are those things that threaten to take the place of God in our lives? Last week, we kind of kicked that series off by talking about, thinking about what is an idol? And simply kind of defining an idol as anything that takes the place of God in our lives. It could be our family, it could be any, uh, any relationship, it could be our favorite sports team, maybe it's our job, our career, maybe it's money, our 401ks, whatever it may be that threatens to kind of dethrone God in our hearts and in our lives. And so we asked some questions last time to begin to think in and press in on our hearts and, okay, what's an idol for us? And so we asked some questions like, what disappoints you? Or what really makes you angry? What infuriates you? Or what worries you? And when you're worried, what is your sanctuary? What's the place that you run to when you're uh, concerned about your life? Where do you make financial sacrifices? Where do you give your money to? Some of these questions, just to try to, to uncover, are there places, are there things, are there people that have become idols in our lives? Have we lost our way in that sense? You see, idols tempt us to believe that if we just have that person or that thing, that your life is going to somehow have purpose and meaning that before you had that, didn't have. But the truth is, that's not, that's not true. See, we're tempted with idols to have this kind of relationship with it that the Bible describes as worship. And God says, no, there's only one that we worship, and that's him. And we were created to, to live for something greater, something bigger than ourselves. And so we want to think some about what does it mean to have these things or these people in our lives that serve as idols. This morning we're going to take a look at one that I was telling one of our elders earlier this week. I'm starting off with a bang. It's a shot across the bow here for many, myself included. But we're going to talk about how does family become an idol. Now let me be clear first and foremost. At Broadway we love families. We love being a part of a family. We love building into families. We want to strengthen and encourage families to not just survive the world, but to thrive in the world. So it's not a matter of not loving our families, but actually something else. You see, somehow, and I don't know if it happens subtly or not so subtly, and I know I have been a part of the problem, but in our good-natured attempt to try to elevate the family and supporting the family that we've kind of missed our mark on where the family actually rests in the kingdom. That we've kind of elevated it as the primary thing, the most important institution in the church. And it's not. And I know for some people that's a tough pill to swallow. How could a preacher say family is not important, the most important in the church? Well, here's why. And here's why I think it is. If we look at the testimony and the, and the work of Christ in his ministry, we're going to hear some challenging words, in fact, a number of them. Uh, I'm just going to look at one this morning, uh, just briefly. You may be familiar with this words of Jesus in Mark or Matthew 10. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now these are hard words from Jesus. What is he talking about? You see, some might read over those and think, well, was Jesus anti-family? And certainly he wasn't. As we think about even the Ten Commandments and where we got this whole conversation started where God says, I want no gods before me, isn't one of those commandments to honor your father and your mother? Isn't it to love and to serve and to take care of our families? Absolutely. But I think there's more to the story. So that's why I want us to look at this story that's found in Genesis 22. It's a story that for me has always been a little bit troubling. It's been a little bit strange. Maybe it has been for you. But it centers around this guy named Abraham. Abraham is an important man in the Bible. If you haven't read his story, I just invite you to go back. It picks up around Genesis chapter 12 and just kind of read through the story of Abraham, really important person in our faith. 
But he was like most men in ancient days, and even men today, who, who longed to have a son, because a son meant family continued on. And my family, the Eif clan, Gabe is the only Eif man who's been born into the grandkids. So it's something I like to brag about a little bit with my sisters, with my brother who's got two daughters, right? Why? Because there's something about having that male heir who will carry on the family name. Abraham was the same way. He wanted a son desperately in those days. It was important that you had a son, and he didn't have one. Well, Abraham's story kind of starts out with God at this amazing time that God makes this promise to him. He says, if you will be faithful to me, if you will follow me, then the world is going to be blessed through you and through your descendants. There was just one catch. You're going to have to leave. You're going to have to leave all that you've ever known, the safety and security of your family, of your friends, of your community, of your homeland, all that you've ever known. And I want you to go to a place that you don't know, and I'm not going to tell you exactly where it is just yet. I just want you to go. And so he went. And he's walking away from all the safety and security and lifestyle he'd grown up and grown accustomed to. And we're told in verse 1, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. And perhaps even more amazing, Abraham goes. He goes. He didn't know where he was going. He didn't know where he was going to wind up. All he knew was that God had told him to go, and so Abraham went. That God's call on his life had demanded that he give up everything that he knew, all he'd hoped for, and instead put his hope now in this new promise that God would bless him through his descendants. There's only one problem, Lord. I don't have any descendants. There are no Abraham juniors. I don't know what I'm going to do with this promise. Oh, and by the way, did I mention Abraham was 75 at the time? And Sarah was 65. And yet God said, you're going to have a son. All right, let's think about that one for a minute. 75-year-old guys, you've retired, coming home for breakfast at the red zone, wife meets you at the door. We're having a baby! Yet, to Abraham, that, those would have been music to his ears. That was the promise he'd been hoping for and hoping for and hoping for. But actually, this promise is given to him, and so Abraham is thrilled. He's not sure exactly how this is going to happen. All he knows is God said it's going to happen. But then it goes along for a little while. It doesn't happen. A decade goes by. And another decade goes by, and another half decade goes by before that son would show up. And so when Abraham turns the ripe old age of 100, and the bride of his youth is 90, she gives birth to a baby boy. And this promise is fulfilled. That the one that he had been waiting for and hoping for, that God had promised, has finally come. And so if you walk, though, back through the story of Abraham, back in Genesis 12, all the way through 22 today, what you would read and see and understand and discover is waiting. The agony of waiting. Now, any of you who ever dealt with infertility, you know this agony of waiting on that hoped-for baby. But you'd also read about the struggle to try and fix and, and, and deliver God's promise for him, don't you? And sometimes God tells us he's going to do this, and, and it takes a little longer than we expect. God works on a different timetable, and certainly we see that played out in Abraham and Sarah's life where they try to, to fulfill God's promise to him through another way, but that's still not the way. That process can't be microwaved. See, God was refining Abraham even in this time of waiting, shaping and forming him. But there's also this other prom process, rather, that's been happening at the same time that Abraham has walked away from this old life. Everything he'd known, all the security, all that he could have put his hope in then to, to this promise that God said, go to this faraway place that I'm not going to tell you, and even though you're an old man, you're going to have a son. And imagine the response of the people of his homeland. Imagine the doubters and the haters who said, are you crazy? You're going where? You don't even know where you're going? You're 75. It's impossible. Well, Isaac, his long-awaited heir, was here. And that promise had been fulfilled. That hope that Abraham had, 
The reason he followed God to Ur, or rather away from Ur, was now right in his arms. But it also can lead us to ask the question, why did Abraham follow in the first place? Why did he go when God told him to go? Was it because he trusted and loved God alone? And I'll do anything you say, God, you just tell me where to go and I will go. Or was it the promise? Well, if I go, then I get all I ever hoped for. That dream of having a baby boy, it'll be mine. Who did Abraham's heart belong to? Is what we see in the pages of of Genesis really the unfolding of a life that's truly a heart that's devoted to God and God alone? Or is it just for what he could get out of God? I know these are hard questions. They're questions that people could ask of us. Don't ask me. They make me squirm a little bit. Maybe they make you squirm too. But if you read through these first 10 chapters of Abraham's story, you might be tempted to think that now that Isaac is here, the promise has been filled, that it's the pinnacle, that this is as good as it gets. All that I've been hoping for and waiting for is now here. And now my son can grow up, carry on the family name. I can now die and go to be with my fathers. I can rest in peace. But that's not what happens. In fact, Genesis 22 is a bit surprising to us. Because God comes once again, and this time he calls Abraham again, only this call is more shocking than even the last one. Verse 2, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. As a father of a son, it's hard to describe the pit that develops in my stomach when I read these words. They're troubling. Isaac was the apple of his daddy's eye. Isaac was the fulfillment of the promise that God had made him. Isaac was what Abraham had been longing for for a hundred years. And notice, God doesn't just say, take Isaac and go. He says, take your son, your only son, whom you love. It's interesting that in this, this is the first time in Genesis that the word love shows up. The first time it shows up. I appreciate so much Kyle Eidelman who wrote uh, Gods at War. Our college students will be familiar with that. They did a study on that book. You've heard me talk about Tim Keller's Counterfeit Gods. Both of them talk beautifully about this story and the power of the story. And we begin to understand that what was going on in Abraham's life was the shift of affection to adoration. This promise that he'd been hoping for and hoping for, that he loved his child, was now beginning to take first and ultimate place in his life. That now what centered Abraham's life in the beginning, God's call, was now kind of being pushed to the side. That now this son I've been hoping for is now taking first place. And it's important to note that I don't think God is trying to say it's wrong for a father to love his son. It's wrong for that to happen. Instead, I think what he's warning Abraham and, and us through this story is not making his son into an idol. Of putting his son in ultimate place in his life making what Keller calls a counterfeit God. That no child, son or daughter, can handle that kind of pressure, that kind of weight. See, if I'm honest, this story troubles me, doesn't it? It troubles me on a couple of different levels. Because whenever I hear a story or read a story in Scripture, I begin to try to identify with the characters. Well, who am I in this? And and who do I fit? Who's most like me? Who am I most like? I don't know about you, but this is a story where I don't want to identify with Abraham. I don't want to say, yeah, I'm that guy. That makes me really uncomfortable to think about that. I don't know that I like that very much. We all know what it's like to love our kids, that we do anything for them. Anything. That's how we feel about other people even in our lives. Family members, close friends. For those of us who play on teams, maybe it's a teammate. But as we spoke about last time, one of the ways that we fool ourselves into believing that we're not struggling much with idols is we start to see idols as just bad things. And if we could just avoid those bad things, then we don't have idols in our lives. But the truth is, as we said last time, that idols often are really good things. We discover Abraham has discovered that God's greatest gift to him could now become his greatest test. See, the better and more beautiful a thing is, the more likely it is to become an idol for us. Did you know that? It's not the opposite. It's not like some outside evil just comes and starts to take over. Often, it's a very good thing. 
In fact, if it's something that we fear losing, more likely it is that we're going to worship it. Why? Because we can't see ourselves without it. And so we asked ourselves last time that question, what's that thing in your life that if you lost it, if you didn't have it, it would make your life not really worth living? Abraham was a wealthy man. He was powerful. He had a lot of money. He had a lot of, uh, of slaves. He had a lot of different things in his life. You notice God didn't test him on those things. The test came with his son. Why? Because that's where he was tempted. That's where he was tempted to make his son into an idol. The story continues on. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and he loaded his donkey. And he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he'd cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. Now, if Abraham was troubled by the request that God makes of him, we don't know. The text doesn't tell us. All we know is that he gets up, he gets all the materials that he will need for this journey, and he sets out on the journey. Now, I don't know what this trip would have been like for you. I don't know what your family road trips were like. Mine weren't very quiet. They were usually pretty loud and chaotic. But Abraham was the only one who knew where they were supposed to go, or at least in the direction that they were supposed to go. And he was the only one who knew the reason why they were going. So I can only imagine the long, awkward silences, perhaps, that existed on the road. Dad, where are we going? I'll tell you. Dad, are we there yet? I'll tell you soon. soon. Dad, are we there yet? Just imagining these conversations that would unfold with him. But finally, he sees uh, off in the distance their destination. He knows it's time to get off the highway, to exit. And he tells his servants to stay. He says, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. And we will worship and then we'll come back to you. Now, a couple of words stand out in this sentence. And I love how Idleman points this out. He says, the first one is worship. We're going to go and worship. And then we'll come back to you. You see, I, I think along the way, I can't help but think along the way, Abraham has this conversation going over in his mind of, of the calling and the promises that God has made and the kind of God that God has been for him all these 25 years as he's waited to see this promise fulfilled in his life. I can't help but begin to think that maybe Abraham was thinking, okay, God's at work here somewhere. God's going to do something. Because he could have said anything. When it's time to go, notice he says, stay here with the donkey while we go over to worship. Now, he could have just said something like I might have said. Well, I got a little business to take care of. You boys wait here. I'll be back. Or I could have made up some other lie, some other thing. I'm going to go do this, and and you guys go do that, and we'll kind of meet back up later. Instead, he says, we're going to go worship. Almost like in his mind thinking, I don't know what's going on. I don't know how this is going to go. All I know is we're going to go worship, spend some time with God, and maybe he'd make it clear. We're going to worship. He's choosing God again to be the center of his life. We also know this because of the word we. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Now, what does he mean, we? If he's going to do what God asked him to do, where does the we come from? When I was a kid, I would say something like that. My dad would say, we? You got a mouse in your pocket? I can't help but wonder, did one of the servants say, Abraham, you got a mouse in your pocket? What are you talking about? We. We will come back. How does Abraham know that we will come back? Well, the writer of Hebrews, the preacher in Hebrews, kind of gives us a window into the story from a little later on. He says this, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. You see, Abraham trusted that God was able to fulfill his promise that he'd made him. Even if it meant the life of his son, that his son would somehow be returned to him. Listen, you guys stay here. We're going to go worship. We're going to go worship a God who I know is faithful, even in death, to restore life. And then we're going to come back. But Abraham held on to that promise. Really? Just because he said the word we? Well, not just that. Listen to the conversation as it unfolds because naturally this conversation takes place as Isaac and his father are going up the mountain. Isaac says, Father, yes, my son Abraham. Abraham replied, yes, my son. The fire and the wood are here. Where's the lamb for that burnt offering? Abraham answers, God himself will provide the lamb 
for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. God will provide, son. God will provide. I don't know if he's saying this out loud more for his sake or for Isaac's sake. I don't know. All I know is he keeps pointing us back to God's heart. God will provide. Son, God's called me to do something. I don't really understand it, but God will provide. He will take care of. He's going to make something happen here. And so they go to that place. They find it. He builds the altar. He binds his son. He lays him on the altar where the animal would normally go, and he reaches for that knife. And he's prepared to do what God had told him to do, only to hear this voice again from heaven calling to him another time. Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld me your son, your only son. Is Isaac an idol for Abraham? I think we see he's not. Abraham's recentered his life and his heart on God. He passes this test. And in doing so, he's able to love his son in an authentic, real way that not only honors God, but it honors, honors Isaac. As Eidelman says, his heart and his loves are rightly ordered. So what about you? What about us? How would we respond if God called us to lay our families on the altar before him? to give up what was most precious to us. How would we respond if we were given this same choice? You see, too often I think this story has been simply interpreted as this blind obedience. He was willing to obey. Abraham does. He just obeys. Notice there's not a lot of talk about feelings. Well, Lord, this kind of bothers me. It makes me nervous inside. Could we talk about that? He doesn't do any of that. It just says God said to do this, and he does it. But I think it's more than just about blind obedience to a command of God, even though I think that's part of what is happening here, is this obedience. But it's a story that invites us to consider our love of God and our willingness to do whatever he calls us to do. And how that sometimes a misunderstanding of our love of family can actually get in the way of us loving God. That it can dethrone God's place in our hearts. What happens when we put our families at the center of our lives? What happens when we put our children at the center of our lives? We make an idol of our spouse or an idol of our son or our daughter or our grandson or our granddaughter. And not only it hurts us, in fact, parents, uh, have you ever had this experience where it seems like your kids are just driving you crazy? Any parent ever been driven crazy? As my mom would often tell my dad, short trip, right? Short trip. They're driving me crazy. Short trip. Yes. We get so worked up over how our kids are behaving, whether they're listening or not listening, that it can actually determine our day. Now, I know none of you struggle with this, but let me tell you about how sometimes it works itself out in my life, that sometimes I can begin to kid myself to think I'm having a good day because my kids obeyed me. They did what I asked them to do. They picked up what I said to pick up. They went where I said to go, and they did it when I asked them. But sometimes... Sometimes, I know you can imagine preacher kids have a little trouble doing what their parents tell them to do. I know you have to kind of suspend reality to imagine that, but, but it happens sometimes. That they misbehave or they disobey. If you've ever been in Target, I was laughing at the story a friend told of being in Target and watching this uh, mom trying to corral her little kiddo who wanted that little plastic thingy that he saw about 10 seconds ago, and now life will never go on unless he has that thing in his hand and takes it home with him, you know, and he melts down. And he said, I was standing there with my kids, and this is unfolding in front, and I'm thinking, should I change another line? And he goes, no, I'm going to let my kids stand and just kind of watch this happen. This will be a little life lesson for them, right? But so often, as parents, we give our children the power to, to fill us with joy and peace or anger and disappointment. And then we get mad at them when they don't fulfill our expectations. You're driving me crazy. You make me so angry. As if that's their job. We've put them in the center of our lives, but that's God's spot. That's his place. They don't have the right to determine our day, but yet it feels like they do. Why? Because they've slowly become the most important thing in our lives. And we take that role of parent very seriously. But see, a disordered heart where the loves are disordered in our lives, it doesn't just hurt us. It doesn't just cause us pain. It causes others pain. In fact, Eidelman talks about a couple of ways 
consequences of this disordered love in our life. Number one, he says it creates this unrealistic pressure. Have you ever been around a family where the, the parents seem to be living vicariously through their kids? You ever seen parents kind of overreact at a baseball game? Okay? In Lubbock, it's a real deal. If you haven't seen it, I saw the cops get called on two moms fighting over, the, over a baseball game, right? Kids feel that pressure, right? What the moms didn't know is that the two boys being fought over were in the dugout crying. Why? Because kids feel the pressure. They understand that unrealistic pressure that sometimes parents put on their kids to perform, to do better. Kaylee and I noticed this, that even into getting them into certain schools or certain daycares, it's pressure. Do you have enough money? Are you smart enough? Do you look right? Do you smell right? Do you talk right? Do you think right? All those pressure. Kids feel that. They understand that. Sometimes we put that pressure on our spouse. Right? We expect them to carry our emotions around with them and to do the best thing for me. And when they don't perform, then I get upset. And what's the matter with you? You make me so mad. As if our spouses can carry that kind of weight around. They're in charge of our emotions. No, they're not. It creates this unrealistic pressure. Well, not only that, it creates unreal, unreachable expectations. That there's no way to actually live up to that non-realistic view of life. Perhaps it's a result of, of growing up in this kind of house for you that it's so easy to turn that onto your kids. And you weren't ever able to please mom and dad and so you kind of give that same little gift back to your kids. See, placing our value or I, our identity on how our kids perform creates this unreachable expectation. He says it also then leads to unreasonable disappointment. That unrealistic pressure and expectations lead us to be disappointed in things and in ways and in a depth that sometimes is astounding. Because kids don't act like adults should, right? You should know that. How did you teach them? Well, no, but they should know it. They better learn it. I think having a family just would solve all of our problems. If I could just get married, if I could just have a couple of kids, then everything would be okay. That's not the way it goes. And sometimes the church, we've been the worst at that. Oh, don't worry, you'll meet somebody someday. Then you'll be happy. D don't worry, you'll have a kid someday. Then you'll be happy. That's God's plan for you. Right? We put this weight, and this burden that the scripture doesn't place on us. And it creates this pressure and this disappointment. The other way, it also then leads to undeserved criticism. We talked some about this last time. Who do we criticize the most? Where are we most tempted to be critical of? And is it because we put that person or that place or that thing in a position of an idol to fulfill things in us that it wasn't created to fulfill? And so we're overly critical of our spouse or we're overly critical of our kids why? Because they're not living up to expectation. They're not providing that which I need from them. The stuff that can only come from God, we tend to put on humans, and they weren't created to do it. The last one, he says, it, then it becomes unfair comparison. You ever lived under the weight of, why can't you be more like Carl? I mean, he's so good, handsome, smart, funny. Why can't you be more like him? Why can't you be more like her? Why can't we be more like them? See, sometimes we not only compare ourselves to others, but we actually compare people to God. And see, that's what happens when we make an idol out of a relationship of a person, of a family, a spouse, as we start holding them to the standard that only God can fulfill. And it's your job to make me happy. No, it's not. It's your job to fulfill when I'm, when I'm hurting. To, no, we have a part in that, but that's, that's God's role. He's the one who brings that fulfillment. See, we can't expect humans to fulfill and to fill a void that was designed for God. And so does that mean we love our family less? No, certainly not. 
It may just mean we need to learn how to love our family differently. See, the best way to love our family is to love God most. The best gift that you'll ever give to your kids, to your spouse, is to love Jesus with all your heart. To our young people, I'll just tell you, that's, that's right there it's worth all the money in the bank you could ever have. Love God. That's the best gift you'll ever give to your future spouse if you, if you get married. And to your kids if you have kids. Adelman writes it like this. I, I love how he words this. When Jesus is truly my Lord, I'm at my best as a husband, a father, a friend. I place myself in a position to receive God's blessings in those relationships. So it's my prayer and desire to love my family enough to lay it on the altar of worship before God with everything else that I have and everything else that I am. In other words, I want to do in spirit what Abraham did physically. I love that. May we be the kind of people who do in spirit what Abraham did physically. One last thing, and I hadn't connected these dots before, maybe you had, but about a thousand years after the story of Abraham and Isaac, we learn that David is told to buy some land. He buys this property to build a place to worship God. Second Chronicles 3 talks about this place where he builds an altar to worship God. You know where that was? Same area, same spot. In fact, not too long after that, Solomon would build the temple right there. Same place. Now another thing, about a thousand years after that, another father would be called to sacrifice a son but only this time it wasn't a test and this father willingly gave his son because he loved us and this son went willingly as he told his followers no one takes my life from me I'm giving it freely you see the son his only son the son that he loved, he gave as a sacrifice for you and me. See, every day we have this choice, this decision to make. Are we going to make our family an idol? Are we going to make our spouse an idol? Are we going to make our child an idol? Are we going to let God be God in our life? That we have this choice to make. Will we choose him? Because church, he's already chosen you. He's already chosen us. Will we choose him? Just a moment, we're going to have uh, some of our elders down here and our prayer team around the, the auditorium and some in the chapel, if you'd like a more private place, to just pray with someone, to talk some more about what it means to kind of dethrone family as an idol in our lives. Not because we don't want to care about and love and support and bless our families, but because we want to learn how to do it in a way that honors God and honors them, that keeps us away from these uh, problems that we run into of a disordered love keep us from the consequences, but instead would actually invite us into deeper, truly meaningful relationship with one another and with our Heavenly Father. Just a moment, Gary and the team will lead us in song, and I just invite you, if you have any, any need to talk about this, or maybe you bring something that has nothing to do with this, you just have a burden on your heart for someone or something, and you just need another Christian brother or sister to pray over you, to gather around you, to encourage you, we'd love to make that for you, opportunity. We want to be community for one another. Let me say a word of prayer over us and then we'll, we'll sing together. Father, I know I've bumbled and stumbled through these words. Just, I don't even know if I've been clear at all, but I, my prayer is that in a deep and a powerful way that each and every person here would know that you love them, that you gave your son for them, that he willingly laid his life down for them because he loves and he cares, and he longs to be restored. Father, I pray that you would encourage each person here today, and especially, Father, to those who are tempted to put their spouse in a place that, that just they cannot live, they cannot sustain the weight and the pressure. Or to those who maybe are tempted to place their kid in that place to look for their relational needs, to, to look for whatever it is that they need from the child that's, that's, not, that's not built to return that. Father, would you help us to take a hard look in the mirror? What are those things? Who are those people that we are tempted to put in place of you? And God, as gently and as kindly, but as truly as you can, Father, would you awaken it to us today?
Lord, would you help us to recognize some of those consequences of disordered love in our hearts? The times we put on unrealistic pressure or unreachable expectations or unreasonable disappointment or undeserved criticism or unfair comparison. You got out there are places in our lives where those things just hit us. God, would you help us to repent? And Father, too often I'm first in line in all of those. And so I just repent, Lord, of the ways that I try to put my family in a place that they can't bear the weight. And I just wreak havoc. Father, would you help me to see, to know in a deeper way, how to find those longings and those fulfillments in you, that I would love you for you. Father, that's my prayer for all of us. Lord, thank you for my brothers and sisters here today. Thank you for their love and their genuine pursuit of you. I pray that you would meet them, you'd minister to them now. As we get a chance to sing and worship together, Father, would you, would you be present in a powerful way? We love you so much. We're thankful for Jesus, for the love that you have for us. We pray this prayer in his name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing together. Over all the earth you reign on high, every mountain stream, every sunset sky. But my one request, Lord, my only aim, is that you reign in me again, Lord, reign. Guys, don't forget tomorrow morning. Gary, are we having, what's, what's for breakfast tomorrow? Is it br- the good stuff? Okay, so yeah. <laughs> Set your alarms. Come on out, guys. It's going to be a good, good morning. Let's sing that last chorus. Well, that first chorus we sang early, early on, and we'll, we'll finish out with that and, and get to football. I'm in the glory land way.